Okay, everybody. Well, I'm um, just going to introduce uh, Chris Birch and Dan Jessico. Um, I'm introducing them as a split personality. First of all, as you know, I'm Professor of Planning um, and, and very much involved in teaching and research around um, planning and sustainability. Um, but I've also got a foot in another camp in that I, um, given my previous professional um, uh, experience and background, I'm non-executive chairman of Hilson Moran, who are a 200 plus uh, strong engineering consultancy who are real specialists in building services and energy usage in building, primarily around commercial buildings in the UK and in the Middle East. And I thought it would be really valuable to have the perspective of um, the scientists that are involved in delivering energy savings in buildings in the commercial context, and that's really what Chris and Dan are going to talk about. So I'm going to hand over to them at this point. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Um, <clears throat> hopefully, um, this will put some of the things we've talked about, especially the last two presentations, in context. And this is a very sort of broad discussion about some of the carbon issues in the built environment and some of the real challenges that we're facing now technically going forward in, in under relatively short time scales. Um, first of all, just a quick advert for Hilsa Moran. This is what we do. We're consulting engineers. We, we, we um, engineer buildings. And um, key point I'd like to make on that, 240 staff is growing rapidly and we'd like as many good CVs through the door as we possibly can get. Um, so uh, any uh, students here, please uh, make contact. So first of all, what are we talking about? Well, in the beginning there was light and um, not necessarily in this order, and then there was fire. And that's really where our problem started. We got to the uh, Industrial Revolution and, and people needed to work together in large buildings and we, we built some absolutely spectacular ones. Um, usually pretty heavy construction um, and relatively small wi windows. So we have some beautiful examples of, of architecture around the country. And also we had smaller spaces but we tended to naturally ventilate them. Um, schools had windows. Um, we, they, most of these buildings are in heating mode most of the time apart from midsummer, and when it got too hot we opened the windows. We then got even more dense and um, we started to build high-rise buildings um, but the early examples of those were naturally ventilated buildings. The offices were around the, the, the perimeter of the, the building and they had windows and they were largely acceptable. And then we get onto a position that Dan's going to tell us a little bit about. Um, yeah, then things changed. Um, in the 1950s, energy became cheaper and technology became available that allowed us to artificially light, artificially ventilate and artificially cool our buildings, meaning that we could build much deeper planned spaces um, that were suitable all year round and we kind of lost touch um, with our connection to the external environment. Um, this is true for offices and this is also true for our homes. What we can see here is that as increasing numbers of households have adopted central heating um, over the last 30, 40 years, so the average internal temperature of our homes has increased. Um, we've, we've disconnected ourselves from the outside and instead of just heating one room, we now heat the whole house because we can and because we like a nice, warm, comfy home. So what you would have thought is that as the numbers of households in the country have increased, as the amount of heating demand has increased, you would have thought that energy use, if we carried on building our homes to a 1970s standard, would also have increased nearly by nearly threefold. What we've actually found is that that hasn't happened. The actual energy used has stayed relatively the same despite increasing numbers of households, despite the fact that we're plugging more and more gadgets into our houses and the fact that we're heating them to warmer temperatures. And why is this? It's because of technology. We're insulating our homes better. We're putting loft insulation, wall insulation, double glazing, now triple glazing. We're using better technology, better, more efficient boilers that recover waste heat um, from the uh, flue gases. So our emissions and our consumption, um, our consumption, I should say, has stayed relatively constant. This does not mean um, our emissions have not increased. Since the 1850s, our emissions have steadily increased thanks to the Industrial Revolution, thanks to an increased population, thanks to increased use of motor vehicles, heating, electricity, all of these things. It's meant that our emissions have actually peaked uh, in the mid-1970s at nearly 
650 megatons of CO2 per year. They have dropped in recent years, but not by nearly enough. In 2008, the government enacted the Climate Change Act, which formally committed the UK to an 80% reduction in CO2 emissions by the year 2050. That takes us back to the 1850s, back to the Victorian times of the buildings that Chris was describing earlier. Does it also take us back to workhouses, to children working in mines, to cholera, to horses and carts in the street, to a pastoral existence in Gin Lane? I would hope not. Interestingly, when you look at a comparative per capita CO2 emissions, that 80% puts us, 80% reduction, puts us on the same level as countries like Belize, Peru, Morocco, Vietnam. All very nice places to visit on holiday, but notably they don't have very cold winters, not very big heating seasons, and also they're not um, representative of our way of living. So what's going to solve this problem? And there's two real issues here. One is technology. How are we going to use technology to, to achieve that 80% reduction? And the other is behaviour change. How are we going to take responsibility for our own emissions to drive this carbon reduction? And buildings are a huge part of this. They emit nearly 40% of the CO2 um, from UK society. So the government has enacted legislation to help drive down the emissions from our new buildings. From next year, all new homes will be built to a zero carbon standard. They will be joined in 2019 by non-domestic buildings. So from 2019, all new buildings will be built to this zero carbon standard. But what about our existing buildings? Well, we replace our existing buildings at the rate of about 1% per year. This means that by 2050, 35% of our building stock will have been replaced. That means 65% of the buildings that are standing today will still be around in 2050. How do we address the emissions from these buildings. And there's no single answer, there's no magic bullet here. There's a range of solutions. Yes, we're going to be able to recover waste heat from our power generation to heat our homes. Yes, we're going to have increasing amounts of onshore and offshore renewables to provide us with clean electricity. And we may even be importing clean electricity from overseas from concentrated solar, solar plants in North Africa. But we're looking at street-by-street uh, street refurbishments, whereby um, teams of retrofitters go around and attack each street at a time, putting on external insulation um, on hard-to-treat properties um, en masse and getting the economies of scale there. And finally, there's behaviour change. The good old woolly jumper you've got lying around at the back of your wardrobe. Turn the thermostat down a few degrees, keep yourself nice, nice and warm with a jumper on, reduce your bills, um, reduce your emissions and take ownership um, of our carbon future. And that's pretty much it from us. Um, contact details there. Thank you.